Geeky Classic Rock. He's an original member of the psychedelic rock group Vanilla Fudge who paved the way for heavy metal and influenced tons of bands, including Yes and Deep Purple. He hung out with Jimi Hendrix and he worked with Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, and Paul Stanley. He also wrote a very juicy book called Stick It, My Life of Sex, Drums in Rock and Roll, and last year reissued his 1995 and 97 records, Guitar Zeus, which literally included everyone. And besides being a gold and platinum selling artist, he's in the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame and the Hollywood Rock Walk of Fame. In the house, we have a legendary drummer, Carmine Apice. Hello, hello, hello. What a nice intro. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sticking it out with us, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, doing this yep. interview with us today. We appreciate it. <laughs> uh, you've been do you've been doing a bunch of drumming videos on Facebook, which has been super awesome. I mean, your fans are loving those I videos know, you're I, doing. And that, yeah, a couple of things came out of this, uh, this, you know, staying home in you know, you know, quarantine. And that's one of them. So I never, ever did that. Really? And I never, I never even thought about doing it because, you know, I just used to put up stuff, you know, his, his cactus and his this and his that and yeah. his picture, you know, but I never, because I didn't, I never had a studio, you know, up in the drum room. It's just a big gym kind of room. It's a really big room. And it was, it was split by a gym. We have a piano up there and my drums, you know, so the drums are very echoey with big sound. And, and I never did it. So finally, I, I, I had to do something for a European magazine. I went up and did it. I tried it. I said, wow, that sounds pretty good. So I always thought, you know, when uh, so I was going to do something like that, to do something like name that beat, you know, where I can play a drum groove and say to the fans, what song is this? Yeah, so that, I tried one. So fun. I think I tried the first one I did was Blue Murder, Valley of the Kings, you know, because that has like uh, over a few million views on uh face on uh, youtube so i did that and i got an amazing response yeah you know and then and i did so i had about a week to do this stuff and then we had uh we got a new puppy dog oh and so when i went out to when i went out to play you know he got scared like crazy crazy scared you know shaking kind of scared oh. and uh so i said wow this is kind of crazy you know What's going on? Is it raining outside? What is this? Oh, see all these little white things flying around. Look like rain. Oh, it's probably your tree. <laughs> your apple it trees. Bugs. <laughs> it might be bugs. Oh. You know, flies, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so so I said, wow, this is pretty cool. So so I did a bunch of them before we got the dog. And I was putting them up. And then when you know, after we got the dog, I tried to play. And he started freaking out. So I had to hold off until my wife took the the dog out of, out of the house, you know, like walking him or to the vet. And then whenever that happened, I'll put up more. I, I do more. I, so the other day, I just did another 10, you know, and I'm going to put them up over the next few days. That's great. And, uh, yeah, so it's a lot of fun. And I, I'm looking at, and it's a lot of fun going, you know, going down the comments and going, no, that's not right. That's yeah. <laughs> correct. So this is right. Yep. And people talking about the tracks and, and some people, friends of mine that were drummers that, I play with White Snake and stuff. They said, "Why don't you do this track?" Yeah, you know, that was one of my favorite tracks growing up. And that was the Paul Stanley track. So I did that, and uh, yeah, it's just been a lot of fun. You know, I did Cactus. I did Vanilla Fudge. I did King Cobra. I did. Uh, next thing I'm going to try is uh, Ted Nugent. Oh, uh, cool! I, actually, I did do Ted Nugent. I'm sorry, I did do Ted Nugent. What I did was uh, I did it with a drum set. I said, "What what band did I play with that I had this drum set?" with these front heads on it and I couldn't believe all the people. And then it, it says you reach so many people. And yeah. I did the vanilla fudge. It says 118,000 people. Reached. I said, said 118,000. <laughs> that, is that right? Does that mean they saw it? Yeah. You know? That's so, was, and that's one, amazing. that's one thing probably about what's happening right now is that you're able to super de duper connect with your fans. I mean, you're, cause you're out there, you're, you're playing, the drums you're putting out these videos and you're answering everybody in the comments so it's you can't do that normally no and i i never did it i I had the time to do it you know but that's that i did it and the other thing is the video thing we did for ronnie yeah yeah you know i 
I never thought we could do that because I don't have a studio in the house. So, you know, when we did that, you know, first of all, the history of that song comes back in 2011, about a year after Lonnie died, when we had a, a King Cobra record deal. And me and Paul Shortino and uh, David Michael Phillips were doing the record for King Cobra. And we had the original band except Paul the singer. So we had the concept of doing a Monsters and Heroes song, but it wasn't going to be about Ronnie at the time. It was about when we were kids, the monsters that became heroes. We used to buy, they had like play dolls and everything, you know, like the mummy and Frankenstein. Right. And the creature of the Black Lagoon and comic books and all that. Yep. And they, those monsters became our heroes. and It was going to be like a Halloween kind of story. And then Paul said, you know, I think I want to write it about Ronnie. Because, you know, he was managed by Ronnie and Wendy. And Ronnie oh, wow. Two of his albums in Rough Cut in the 80s, but he was very close to Ronnie. And he said, you know, Monsters and Heroes, Dragons and Rainbows in the Dark. I said, wow, that's great. Yeah. And the first line, sing a song, sing it, you're the man on the mountain who wrote the songs we all love. What a great line. I said, yeah, let's definitely do it. So he did it. We recorded it with King Cobra. We sent it to Wendy Dio. She used it on the charity to raise money. Uh, then when I got it back, in 16, we went to... Uh, King Cobra went to Sweden Rock Fest and we played that song. The only time we ever played it on that tour, we did four gigs. And the last gig was Sweden Rock. We had the whole audience singing the song, 8,000, 9,000 people. Wow. And, uh, and it was really awesome. So then when I came back from there, we had the record deal going with me and Vinny. So I said to Vinny, you should play on this track and we should put this on our album because you play with Ronnie. You were best friends. I was friends with him. And through you, he became like our fourth brother. You know, he went to all our family events. Oh. So he had no family out in California. We had our full family, mother and father and, and cousins and, you know, nephews and nieces and brothers and sisters. So when we had a, a Christmas party, it was 30 people there. So Ronnie would come. Wow. You know? Yeah, and, so that uh, had to be hard. Hard. Yeah, hard. and then he, then he died. And we saw him in the hospital, saw him in the funeral home, you know, saw him in the cemetery. It was horrible. Yeah. So then... I said, Vinny, you got to play in this song. So we, he did. We did it on the album. We did the video with that song. It became the biggest song on our album. So every night that we played the album from and on, we played the, the shows, we did that song. So three weeks ago, Vinny called me up and said, you know, we should do one of these Partridge family uh, <laughs> you know, videos like everyone's doing. And, I, and somebody told me on this, oh, doing these interviews, they, they called it the Hollywood Squares, you know, <laughs> the video. And I said, yeah, that'd be a good idea. I said, what song? He said, it's the Monsters and Heroes. That's our biggest song. I said, that's cool. And then we said, you know, it should be something special. And it's too bad we, we can't just do it for something special. He said, you know what? In three weeks, two and a half weeks, is Ronnie's 10th anniversary of his passing. And the song's about Ronnie. Maybe we should just release it and tribute to Ronnie and celebrate Ronnie. I said, man. You did an awesome job with that video. And I did know that it was the 10th anniversary because a lot of people had been talking about it prior. Because there, people were, you know, very sad. I mean, a lot of people so close to Ronnie. And yeah. so that you did a great, great job with it. Really, yeah, really so great. So we're hoping that more people know about it now yeah. because of, of this, you know. Ronnie was and a that, very loved man. He was, and he was a really nice guy. He always treated my brother great. He was a, a great guy to hang out with, you know. I mean, he, he's done great things for me. Like, I, I got married in 1983. Uh, I've been since divorced from that wife, but uh, he threw me a, a, a bachelor party in the strip bar. Ouch. You know, <laughs> and uh, and then he, he came to the wedding. You know, when I started a Rocker Records in 1980, what was that, 89 or 90? I had a party at my house. He came to the party. You know, he was always around. We rehearsed in the same rehearsal place when he was doing their first album. We were doing a, a Vanilla Fudge album. We had a lot of fun together in that rehearsal space. Wow. You know? yeah. And he's always been really good, always been really nice. Well, you know what? You always hear great things about Ronnie, really. And he was a great singer. Yeah. He wasn't, they say he's a great heavy metal singer. He's just a great singer, period. Right. Yeah, you know, he can sing anything. I, I, I can I, I think he could sing Frank Sinatra if he had to. Probably. You know? Probably. Because you know, listen to the beginning of the last in line, that beginning is so great vocal, great soulful vocal. Oh yeah. Soulful. A lot of those bands, mm-hmm. Soulful. A yeah. lot of those bands in the eighties, 
you know, they the, the singers weren't very good. Yeah. You know, they recorded good, but live, they didn't have that power. They didn't have that voice, you know. There's only a few people have that voice. You know, like I know he had it, my singer, and, and Vanilla Fudge Stein, he still has it, you know. And, uh, you know, a lot of, not a lot of guys, Rod Stewart, you know, just some great voices. Right. Now, Carmine, you grew up in Brooklyn with your brother, Vinny. You were about 21, I'm thinking, when you joined Vanilla Fudge, and Vinny was Actually, about... I was, I was, I was uh, 20. Oh, okay. 20. I was ni- 19. Jeez. And so Vinny was much, much younger. He's, what, 11 years younger than you. Yeah, Vinny was, uh, so he was what? If I was 19, he was eight. Eight. So did you yeah. have an influence on Vinny to become a musician? Of course. I mean, I left drums home. I would come home, you know, driving a Jaguar. <laughs> I'd be wearing my full stage gear in the street all the time. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right, red velvet jackets and scarves and psychedelic oh. shirts and, and, and velvet pants from England, you know. And then and I, even before that, I used to have band rehearsals when he was like five years old. And my older brother was older than both of us. And he had um, a, a singing doo-wop kind of group. So he'd rehearse with them sometimes at the house. And I would rehearse with drums with the band. So he was like well-inspired. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as he got older, and I started being on the Ed Sullivan show, like when I was uh, 68. So now 68, he was he was uh, 11 years younger. I was 20, 21 almost. So he was like 10. He'd see me on TV and hear me on the radio, see me on magazines and album covers. So he said, I want to do that. So I left drums at home and he started playing them. And one time I went home and. He grabbed me. He was like, you know, half my size. He pulled me in the porch where we had the drum, and he stopped playing it. He's played good. Yeah. My mother said, how is he? I said, he's really good. And so so what do you think? I said, how did he, how did he get good like that? He goes, he goes in there every day after school. He stays in there for hours, driving me crazy <laughs> like you did. <laughs> so... She said, what should we do? I said, we should send him to my drum teacher. So we did. By the time he was like 12, 13 years old, he was great. That's awesome. You know? That he is 16, so cool. 17, 16, I think he played with John Lennon. Gosh. You know, did, did hand claps on uh, whatever gets you to the night and jam with him. And ended up when he was 17, he quit high school. And he played uh, he played a gig with him, you know. Man. And, and Rick Derringer called him. Oh. He was 17 years old. He's out on the road with Derringer. Holy Opening moly. up for Aerosmith and stadiums. Gosh. And then he joined Black Sabbath. So he had a, a good swing up. You yeah. Know? yeah, he certainly did. Now, Carmine, yeah. tell us about when you went on Ed Sullivan. That had to be such an amazing experience for you because you guys looked up to the Beatles and now you're on Ed Sullivan. What was that like? Yeah. I mean, we weren't look. I only started looking up to the Beatles when uh, Revolver came Okay. Before that, the Tina Bop is like people. I get a lot of drummers. I'm listening to interviews. They go, when I Beatles, I said, I want to be in the rock business. I want to be a rock star. That wasn't me. You know, yeah. I was a, when the Beatles came out, they were a joke to me. Really? You know? Yeah. 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 They were a joke. We said, I, I want to hold your hand was not exactly a very technical, great, you know, musical song for, for a guy that was in R&B and, and had a horn band and, Listen to James Brown and Otis Redding and all that stuff. So that wasn't, the Beatles weren't me. I appreciate it now that I know more about songwriting and producing and parts and songs and choruses and all that stuff. Right. But, you know, as a matter of fact, we used to goof on their songs. We used to play weddings and put Beatle wigs on and do dirty <laughs> versions of their songs. <laughs> Listen, do da do, let me stick it in your ear, you know. <laughs> Is that stick it again? Yeah. <laughs> you just you just like those two words, I guess. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but when they did Revolver and like Day Trip or songs like that, which really caught our attention. Yeah. And we were doing the first Vanilla Fudge album when that album came out. But so when we finally got to the Ed Sullivan show, you know, we had seen the Rascals on there. That that left more of an impression on me than the Beatles, because the Rascals were great musicians. 
you know. Mm-hmm. They weren't a teeny bopper band to the point of the Beatles. All you hear was girls screaming with them, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, we, we have to rehearse for a few days. And then you, you go up in the room, you get dressed, and you come down, and you do it live. And I remember going down in the elevator. In those days, they didn't have push-button elevators. They had an elevator operator. So I said to the guy, hey, there's a black guy. I said, so how many people watch this show? You know, we're all in the elevator. He goes, oh, about 50 million. And my stomach just started getting butterflies. You so know? you had no idea? No, you didn't have no idea, you know. In those days, it's not like now where, where you have all these numbers on the news, you know? True. You didn't know how. You just know it was a big show, but you don't know really how many people watched it. I mean, I probably didn't even know how many people were in the United States at that time. Yeah, true. You know? So you was know, Ed so, Sullivan, was he nice to you guys? What was he like? Yeah, he was nice. You know, he was very cordial. It wasn't any anything great. He took pictures with us, came in the dressing room, said, hi, guys. I hope you have a very big show. Congratulations <laughs> for being on the show. And good luck. And then he'd walk out. And he might shake our hand, you know. But then uh, once we hit the stage, all the butterflies went away. And we just kicked ass. Yeah. And we left such an impression on the audience that I, the next day, our single, You Keep Me Hanging On, sold 250,000 copies. Jeez. You know. But I, I do have to ask you, what was it like to be friends with Jimi Hendrix? I mean, that had to be a trip in itself. Well, Jimi Hendrix was a friend before he was Jimi Hendrix. He was Jimi James, you know, and we played the New York scene together. He was just like another musician there, a guy you know, he'd smoke pot with and talk to and hang out, yeah. you know, and he'd go on play. He was always a great performer, you know, and, you know, we don't play in the same circuit, the same clubs in New York before he made it. And then we, I was in Vanilla Fudge when I saw the first pictures of this guy, Jimi Hendrix, Playing with his teeth, I said, "Wow, <laughs> I know him." Like Jimmy James. Wow. You know? And sure enough, it was. And when I met him in England, uh, after he made it, Vanilla Fudge made it, I said, I reminded him of, of who I was and some of the bands I was in that we played together. And he remembered, and then he said, "What are you doing here?" I said, "I'm in Vanilla Fudge." He said, "Oh, I love the Fudge." <laughs> you know, and you know, so we you know, we did a lot more gigs with him and played with him, and we used to. I jammed with him at the at the record plant after a night of jamming at the scene, a nightclub around the corner from the record plant. You know, it was a whole New York scene. That, and he used to play those gigs and play all that stuff. And he was, he was a normal guy, very timid and very, very uh, calm, timid, introverted a bit. Just like Prince was like that. Really? Well, you know, but he'd get on stage, it was like crazy. Yeah. Know? He was but, a. Uh, there's a couple of groupies that me and him shared over the years, you know. And, <laughs> no, not and, you, and Carmine. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, he was a good guy. I mean, we, when we went on tour, you know, we, we all traveled together and we all took over the plane. You know, we weren't no private planes, no buses. You know, we all got on a regular plane. All the gear went under the plane. The, tr- the truck, carrying all the gear, was pulled right up to the belly of the plane. I put the gear right into the into the plane. There's no security. Wow. You know, it was it's just a whole different lifestyle, a whole different era. Yeah. You know, we used to pay the sky cap a hundred bucks, and you take the whole state set. Every there was no state set. It was just amplifiers and drums. We didn't have no stages. You know, each stage was uh, put up by the promoter. Yep. And all the lights were put up by the promoter. PA put up by the promoter. Nobody traveled with the full stages like they end up doing now, you know? You had your gear and your voice and your That's it. creative you skills, know? and that was that. That's right. And we'd all be on the plane. There'd be like 30 of us on the plane, all the bands and the road crew, you know, and we, and we, we would take over the different you know, parts of the plane. <laughs> the, the, the first class, the coach, the economy, you know, it was, it was wild. You know, it was really wild. Now, when Led Zeppelin first performed in the United States in 1968, they actually opened for the fudge. They did. Do you think they back did. and, and go, only, what What the heck? Did, and, and not only did they open for it, we paid half of their fee. Come on. Yep. Wow. The show was in Denver, December 26, 68. We had heard the album, and uh, it was set up for them to go on tour with us. But on the very first gig, 
It was already sold out. It was Vanilla Fudge and Spirit. 7,000 yeah. people approximately. Jeez. And we got paid, I don't know, under 10 grand. But it was a good, good amount of money. And the promoter was Barry Faye. The agent was our agent, uh, Ron Terry. And he said, oh, we want Jimmy Page's new band, Led Zeppelin. And, and Barry said, we don't need him. We're sold out. He said, yeah, but, you know, we, you know the band wants a fudge want him on there. And, and uh, Phil Basile, Fudge's manager, want him on there. And the lawyer, Steve Weiss, we had the same lawyer, the same agent. And uh, the managers were very close, uh, you know, friendship. So, so finally, my agent says, how about we do this? It's fifteen hundred dollars for Led Zeppelin. Get that, right? Fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred bucks, yeah. <laughs> you pay seven fifty, and Vanilla Fudge will pay seven fifty. He said, "Okay," and he put them on. They opened up to do like twenty, thirty minutes. They got seven fifty from us and seven fifty from him. That's insane! Insane. That's the very first gig, Jeez. you know. And then we did some other gigs with them, like in Portland and uh, Seattle, and uh, then they played. And they played the Whiskey A Go Go. Yep. Man. And we played a few other gigs with them. And then their album came out and it went huge. And we did a whole other tour with them in 1969. And I had gotten a duplicate drum set like I for John Bonham. We became good friends. And we went on tour again together. We did the whole summer of 69 together. Mm. And that was a lot of fun. A lot of crazy stuff. I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, Comrade, that song, You Keep Me Hanging On, you you covered that. The Supremes did it first. And you guys literally took that song, The Supremes did it in a very poppy way, and you put right. your psychedelic injection into that song. Yeah. You made it a and completely... We made it heavy. Di- you, we made it heavy. You did. But what made you guys decide to take that particular song and do what you did to it, which worked well, wonderfully? All, that was... That was what was going on in Long Island, you know? And in Long Island, the Rascals started it. They, they would do like Slow Down by the Beatles, which they slowed down. They did Midnight Hour and they slowed down a bit. So the group called The Vagrants that had Leslie West in it took, took it to the extreme. And they really slowed down things like, like they did Satisfaction, like bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Dun, 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 you know, and they made it really heavier and more of a production than what we call them. So, so what we used to do is listen to songs and try and match the mood of the music to the mood of the lyrics. Hmm. So if you listen to Set Me Free by Don't You Be, Get Out My Life, you know. Right. If you really lyrics, it's a hurting situation. Emotional lyrics done like a happy song. Interesting. Right? Yeah. So we took it and slowed it down. We were able to put soulful, uh, emotional, soulful lyrics, you know, uh, make them emotional, soulful lyrics to an emotional, soulful vocal. Yeah. You know? And that we you did, did our intro, which created tension to build up to it. And that's what we did. If you listen to our first album, we did that song. We did Take Me For A Little While, which is the same kind of thing. You know, another mm-hmm. kind of sad song. We slowed down, made it emotional. Ellen and Rigby, we matched the eerie, cemetery, churchy, you know, kind of spooky right. mood to the song. Because that's what the lyrics dictated. People get ready. We made it a gospel kind of song. You know? Yeah. So that's what we did. Yeah. And then when you were in Beck Bogert and a piece with Jeff Beck and... Tim mm-hmm. Bogart, you did kind of, you know, you did the cover of Superstition. So did you do that song because Jeff Beck was involved with Stevie Wonder during? Well, the deal was Jeff Beck was, that was the payback to Jeff Beck playing on Stevie's album. Stevie was going to write him a song. So he wrote the song the way Stevie released it, right? So, so we had the demo of that song and we, we learned it. And while we were recording it our way, we made it more rockify because we didn't want to play it like Stevie. You know? right. We we weren't those, those kind of players. So we were recording it. Motown heard the demo and they said, this is, this is the number one record. They put horns on it and they released it. Gosh. So by the time our version came out, it was like a cover. It was <laughs> like what we did with 
just keep me hanging on. We slowed it down, made it rockified and heavy. Yeah. You know, so that's how that happened. But Stevie wasn't supposed to release that. That was supposed to be the song for Jet. Wow. <laughs> it's just crazy how, you know, the the covers you guys did, though, worked for you. Yeah. They, they just worked. And you made them, you made them work. And everybody loved yeah, them. Well, yeah, well, here's, here's a, another little spoof that we're doing now. Uh, we have Cactus, and the, the, new, the new guitar playing Cactus played with Rod Stewart, Joe Cocker, um, Tina Turner. He's a great player, and uh, you know, he played with Rod 14 years. Wow. And his claim to fame when he first grew up, he's 17 years old, grew up in Detroit. He played on Top is Like a Rolling Stone. Oh, my gosh. So... When we went out with Cactus, this was, well, he's been with us a couple of years, we started playing around, and we tell the story that he was 17 and he played on that song, and then we play a little bit of it, you know, just off the cuff. And, we, and it's got longer and longer, and the audiences love it. So we, we're doing a new album. The first song we, we cut was Pop is Like a Rolling Stone, a whole new version done Cactus style, real heavy guitar-oriented. That's awesome. And kick-ass solos and harmonica and awesome and big-ass drums and great bass parts, great vocals and Paul sings and so the cactus singer Jimmy Coons and they, they alternate the vocals. I did backgrounds with him. It's awesome. I just heard the mix today. It's it's freaking awesome. That's so cool. Isn't that neat when you can hear something back and go, "Gosh, that sounds so good." Yeah, I mean it's, it's awesome when you when you can do that. That's like happened with this uh, Dio tribute. You know, when we did the, the the videos, everyone did the videos and the audios, and we put it together and mixed it, put the video together. So, oh my God, this is awesome! I know. <laughs> I know when I watched it, I said, really "How did these, how do these people do this?" You know, it, it just came out so perfect. It's like you're yeah, and, you didn't have to be in the same room with each other. Yeah, exactly. Because we played the song so much. That's the same thing that happened with this. This top of like a rolling stone. We played it a bunch of times in gigs that we actually knew what we did. We just rearranged it a little more and made it really, really cool and different, you know. But um, the thing with the the, the Dio tribute, you know, the way Artie, our guitar player, mixed the sound was great. Yeah. And the way he did the editing in the video, it wasn't just four cameras, five cameras to stay still. You know, the screen, all the screens moved around and the scenes moved to the music. Yes. So it added twice of the energy that we had on the track, which really made the whole project energetic with a lot of energy. It's so true because now that you say that, when I was, I I watched it a few times and I said, geez, zooming in on, you know, Vinny and you and, and just different angles. It was so well done. And the music was so crisp. Every, this, the audio is so good. Yeah, and you know when you said, what, is there anything you learned today? Mm-hmm. That, that you, that's one of the things we learned. So I think when we do this cactus video, we might do it like that. Yeah, it, it's so good. You, you get a video budget to do a video like that. It's so cheap to do. And in the screens, you could put in other things. You could put anything. You could film, you know, lyrics. You can have whatever you want, animation. Put it in there. And you could probably, for the price of one video, you could do five videos. Right. For an album instead of one. You, you can, can even change the scenery. You can make a green screen behind you. Yeah. You know, and put stuff behind you. You can be in China. You could be, you could be on the ocean. You could be in a plane. You could be wherever you want to be. You could throw some of that old footage if you have it in there too. That would be yeah, really you could, all that stuff. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's a new group with Mike Portnoy come, that came out today. A video of the cactuses evil song no kidding right? which with that's becoming our staple song last year clutch did it the year before blackstone cherry did it monster magnet did it Dee snyder did it uh even uh, greta van fleet did it uh, on a live on an encore and uh the dead daisies did it uh, everybody a lot of people did this song. wow so they did it today and, and they asked me for some old footage and some old pictures of cactus and they actually put cactus in there you know, and they were giving cactus like a, a bit of dew to cactus. That's in, awesome. In their video. That's awesome. Which is great. And then they just had a blabbermouth today, talking about the video and talking about how 
legendary the cactus was, did this video with cactus and the legendary cactus was, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, talking about the band. And I said, wow, this is so cool. Yeah, that's going to make you feel really good, Carmine. It does. It, it does make you feel good, especially when I got Mike Portnoy playing Carmine drum solo. Because Mike is like uh, the, one of the new guys who's one of the cool guys. He's like the Neil Pert of part of this generation dang you know and he's playing my fills or playing my song you know playing my drum parts and I, that's pretty cool yeah of course of course it's gonna and make he's a you... friend of mine too yeah he's a friend of mine you know yeah it makes yeah. you feel honored totally totally now do you yeah. think i'm sexy <laughs> can you just mm-hmm. tell well, us i haven't seen you yet <laughs> yeah i'm totally you know listen we're in quarantine i'm not that sexy <laughs> Me too. I'm getting my hair cut tomorrow. The Carmine, you look good. I'm telling, like, I, I'm watching you going. You look really good. What are you doing to keep yourself looking good? Because really, well, a little hair dye. My hair is totally white. You know? No kidding. I mean, I'm, I'm dying to let it grow all the way out and it's, put some purple in it, but I just can't get the balls to do it. Oh, do <laughs> it! Come on, you just know? do it. And and you know, I, I eat good. I, I try and do the gym every other day, you know, and work out and play drums and uh, try and eat good, you know. Well, and I'm, I'm Italian, you know. I'm Italian. Well, so, true. You know, my, uh, us Italians. I've got that Italian olive skin and olive, or, uh, olive oil on my skin. There you go. And my, my arms and everything are looking old, but my face still looks okay. No, I, but I literally watch you on Facebook going, de- like, how, first of all, the energy that you put into your drum playing. I mean, you know, it's it's a lot what you do. Well, I just turn you just turn the button on and it goes, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's like that uh, the the energizer battery, the, the bunny. You know, <laughs> turn that thing on and, and, and there I go. You know? <laughs> I mean, sometimes after my solo, I feel my heartbeat. I feel like about a hundred and hundred and thirty. Maybe it's about a hundred and thirty beats a minute. You know. Yeah, just don't drink coffee after you do one of those. No, no, definitely. <laughs> I won't be able to sleep. Put you into outer space. You know? Now, yeah. so the Rod Stewart song, Do You Think I'm Sexy? How did you guys yeah. write that? Like, where did that come from? Did that come from? Well, it came from, it came from Missing You by the Rolling Stones. Okay. Rod wanted a song like that. So I went back and I came up with chord structures and some ideas. Went to my friend's studio. We put it down as a demo. Rod loved it. When we first put it down, had three guitars, bass, drums, and a keyboard. My friend Dwayne Hitchens playing keyboard. Yep. And it sounded great. It was big, fat rock song. And Rod had the lyric on it. And and the uh, da 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 was done by a synthesizer. And that's it. And then Tom Bout said, well, let me do my magic. He did his magic. We had one 24-track to start. He had a second 24-track with a 30-piece orchestra with... Uh, uh, some singers singing high notes for that line and Tom Scott and brought in David Foster to play keyboards. Before you know it, everything had to shrink. So it all shrunk down so it didn't sound like that big rock song anymore. It sounded like a, a disco rock song. Yes. But he said, trust me, guess what? It came out and was number one in every free country in the world. Did you know? So, did you know before that song was released it was going to be that big? No, no. Nobody knew. You know, when we did the video, if you watch the video, I'm doing the drum shows. I didn't even know what drum shows I played. <laughs> because, you know, we just do all this stuff. But in those days, everything was played on the cuff. You know, we never played it the same twice, you know? Yeah. And now I look at it, I laugh. Because that drum show <laughs> at the end of the song, for instance, has become such a staple in the song You've heard it so many times. It's been around so long. It's like knowing the drum fill in uh, Stairway to Heaven. You know, bop, 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 you know, yeah. Everybody knows that drum fill. Yes. So, you know, I, I laugh at it now, and I'm looking at the video, and I can't even, you know, I didn't even play the thing right because I didn't know it. <laughs> well, no, but we didn't know. Knows. We didn't know when we watched it, so it, it no one cared because it all went together so perfectly, and it's just the song even today is still the such a, a great song. Rod in those days was the best front man and the greatest rock singer, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. I mean, bar none. Greatest showman. And I learned a lot from him about image. And he, he was just really, really great, you know. So, Carmine, thank hey, you. Kiki. <laughs> hey, hey, thank you, Kiki. And uh, do you think I'm sexy? <laughs>
You know what, Carmine? I do. And thank you so, so uh, much. Thank you. It was a fun, <laughs> really a fun time. Let's do it again. All right, thank you, guys. 